Good morning, Virgin Islands. It's a new day. It is hot outside and we need rain. But we welcome you to appreciate it in peace and goodwill, compassion, and contemplation of all our many blessings here in the territory. And I really mean that. It doesn't matter what is happening in your life today. There are some good things around us, and we just need to try to focus on them. Unfortunately, we still live in a time of severe challenges to our economy, our environment, our social structures, and our quality of life. And I don't have to enumerate these things for you because everybody listening to me knows exactly what I'm speaking about. And our point today is not to talk about so much everything that's bad, but how we make things better. But it is true that the high level of violence we experience in our territory diminishes and destroys the benefits we have gained from hard work, cooperation, and building our future. It is time to work on making our community a more peaceful place to live. My name is Laverne Raxter, and it is my pleasure to co-host this program this morning with Sean Pennington, and we have been having big fun here with technical difficulties and getting guests on the phone and so forth and so on, but I'm so glad you're here, Sean. Good morning. I'm glad I'm here, too. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we want you to know that you are listening to Talking Solutions, Taking Responsibility. This program is one arm of the Rotary Practice Peace Initiative, and we aim to introduce you, our growing listening audience to the individuals, groups, and concepts that are dedicated to reducing conflict on our island and making life more peaceful for us all. We understand that peace is far more than the absence of violence and that it begins with us. I cannot emphasize that, you know, in any more, in any little way. It has to be a big thing. It begins with us. So we welcome you to embrace this new day in which we have another opportunity to take responsibility for our community and the well-being of our family, friends, and neighbors. As a community, and we are a community, despite the fact that some of us think that we live in separate little um, systems and small little groups, we are a full community. Let's take advantage of another day to resist blaming others and to focus our intelligence, energy, and talents on solving our own problems. So today is another opportunity to understand that the problem is with us, and with that, so is the solution. I offer and ask you again to think about the fact that you could use a rotary four-way test to help make better decisions in your life, to think about things in a more constructive way. So ask yourself, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? I can, can you imagine if everyone in public service, in the private sector, in our families did that? How different this world would be, my goodness. Mm. I mean, sometimes I, I look at something happening, I think, what were you thinking? Anyway, there are 38,000 um, Rotary Clubs across the world, and the, the 10 that are in um, the Virgin Islands, 6 in St. Thomas and St. John, join all of these clubs by acknowledging that we should concentrate our efforts on the first area of focus of Rotary, which is peace and conflict resolution. And since, unfortunately, we still rank very high in the world with respect to number of um, homicides and deaths um, that are violent, we need to do that. This project, the Practice Peace Initiative, seeks to walk with the people of the Virgin Islands down the path to peace as we deliberately and exponentially reduce violence by 75% in our community by 2023. We're in a time when people put a stake in the ground and say, this is what we want to do. This is where our stake is. And we ask everyone to understand that they're a part of getting there. So uh, before we uh, thank our sponsors and introduce our guests, I wanted to remind people that um, as I, my mother used to tell me this, and I keep saying it, um, there's nothing new under the sun, and so you need to figure out where you fit. And so what mm -hmm. we do here in this Rotary Practice Peace Initiative actually um, is based on the work that groups and individuals and institutions have done over the years and continue to do here in our territory in their um, goal to reduce violence and bring peace among all of us. So we hope to continue to do that. As I said, we're still working with young people, 
and we're still trying to identify groups and individuals that are doing things in the community that are helping us uh, to be a, a less violent place. So if you have any suggestions, you can call me at 643-6550 uh, or Sean at 777-8144. That's 777-8144. And we would be happy to connect with these folks and see if we can get them on the air to be a part of our conversation. Before I introduce our, our guests, let me just tell you that you don't do things in this world without help. And we want to thank um, our supporters who have given us donations for the last almost two years now. And they would be one Sunrise Rotary, excuse me, St. Thomas Source, First Communications, the West Indian Company Limited, and the Water and Power Authority. Thank you, folks. You have made a difference. And we hope that you feel that investment has been worth it. So with that, I'm going to ask Sean to introduce our guest. And we're going to have an interesting conversation here because we're sharing one mic with three people and having somebody on the telephone. So I don't think we're going to be able to have people call in, so apologies for that. It would be very difficult to, to work that one out. Um, but we hope that you'll listen to the conversation. And if you see us on the street, you could tell us your comments and suggestions then. So, Sean, would you introduce our guest? I'd be glad to. And, and as, as I'm doing that, I, as Laverne was mentioning our sponsors, when you guys see our sponsors out there on the street, oh, some, yes. you know, somebody who works at the Water and Power Authority or WICO or, you know, Choice Communications, thank them. You know, in, in, what we're hoping to do here is to stop the criticism and start working with the solutions. And we're so good, it's so easy to criticize people and institutions. It's a lot, it's a lot, and believe me, I'm saying this from personal experience. It's a lot harder to look at what the, what the positive sides are, and they equal the negative sides. That's universal law, in my opinion. So, you know, as you're out there in the street and you see the people who have supported this, and we hear thank you all the time. Laverne and I hear that from people constantly. But, you know, thank our sponsors, too. So with that, I want to introduce our guest this morning. Um, I will introduce Yasin Hall first. Yasin, are you there? I'm here. Good morning, everyone. That's awesome. Yasin is calling in from Florida. She is the author, I'm feeling weepy about this because it must have taken an incredible amount of courage to do this. She's the author of a memoir called Journey Untold, Twisted Love, My Mother's Struggle with Mental Illness. And um, she's going to talk to us, I'm sure, from a personal standpoint. And uh, there's a lot to be said about this subject. And also with us this morning is someone who I met recently and have deep admiration for for what she does. She's incredibly committed. And that's Tesha Tyson, who's the program director for the St. Thomas Healthcare Management Inc., which many of us know as a couple of different names, the Adolescent, um, the Seaview Adolescent Treatment Center, and also St. Thomas Academy. Yeah. So, yeah, it, sorry, Tasha, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to have you here. So, you know, we want to start, I, I think one of the things that we, um, perhaps can talk about, and Yasin can speak to both of these women can speak to this. And again, bear with us, folks, because we're working with one microphone, so there may be a few little gaps in the conversation. Uh, mental illness has a stigma in the community. And one of the things that I was thinking about this morning, because I very often uh, connect with the young man who's down in front of the post office, um, who actually tries to work. and. Uh, and I love him. I mean, I have love in my heart for him. But it's always hard to know how to communicate with people who do appear to have mental illness. And you do it on a daily basis, um, Tesha. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, good morning again. Um, it can be um, a challenge. Um, I personally know the young man that you're speaking of. Um, he's a classmate of mine. Um, and Yasin as well knows who he is. Mm -hmm. um, um, you have to be very careful because it could be that they may not be in the frame of mind where they understand that you're being friendly. So I would be cautious. However, um, if, if they're in care, then it's more of um, an easier task in being able to communicate with them. So with, with the 
children that are in my particular unit, you know, it's a controlled environment, so it's much easier for us to be able to communicate with them. So what is your suggestion for people walking on the streets? I mean, most of many of us know a lot of these people. Um, it, it just depends because it could, it could change at any moment because of the mental illness. And you never know. So I would, I would be cautious. I would be very cautious. Um, I, I wouldn't walk right up on them. Right. I would stay a few feet away and politely, calmly, in a soft tone or, you know, in a tone of, of that can be welcoming and not barking or yelling or screaming for many of them. You know, for anyone, it's agitated to be screamed or yelled at. So that's something that I would say not to do. I would also okay. like to add that if you keep your hands down and just keep eye contact and your facial expressions in a positive way, they see that. They don't see you as a threat if your hands are down and your facial expressions are positive. And a simple, how are you doing, will go a long way. When you were saying that about not yelling, at them, I'd like to propose the notion that maybe we should carry that across all of our relationships, not just with the yeah. mentally challenged people that we face in the community. And I have to wonder, and I know I can tell Laverne's got a nervous look on her face about what I'm going to say, but we've got to stop yelling at our kids. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So it, it may be a cultural thing on some level, but it, yeah, we need to stop. Thank you. No, one of the things I was going to say is that we um, proposed that if people, you walk by somebody and you smile, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that that seems to work for the mentally healthy. I don't see why it would work for somebody who is not feeling so well. My experience has been to smile and nod and, and, and to be consistent. Uh, you don't know what they're going to be in that day, but it seems to me that if they can remember, it is a positive Yes. interaction in that way. Again, folks are not asking you to take on something mm -hmm. bigger than you are able to handle, but you can be a, uh, a positive factor as opposed to a negative one. I observed something because I do have a relationship with this man. And, uh, you know, yeah, he knows who I am and he loves me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really interesting. But I'm not the only one he loves. I watched him the day before yesterday. I went to pick up my mail. And there were some tourists coming across that crazy little triangle in front of the post office, and he yelled. I mean, and I'm sure he might, might have frightened them, but there was a car coming that they couldn't see, mm. and he was like, stop, stop. And he was, he, and I looked at that, and I thought, it is his nature in his heart to be helpful mm -hmm. and to be protective. And it really, just talking, I hadn't told anybody about it until just now. But that's, you know, we, we're just all people, and that's what Laverne and I are trying to kind of put out there. And, you know, when we started this, we both agreed that we have a lot to learn about this, this whole idea of peace and conflict res resolution as well. And I've been having an ongoing email thing with somebody who is highly respected in this community, and when I was shocked by this person's tone in her emails to me, and I will, she is lucky that she will remain nameless. But um, and ignored on my part. But when you look at people who are highly, you know, supposedly highly regarded people, and the way that they, you know, think that they can talk to people, and then you watch someone who's really challenged trying to help. It's amazing. And you know, both of you, yeah. So maybe you talk a little bit about your relationship, you know, with your mom and how that went. Um, it, it, it was different stages because her mental illness progressed as the years went on. And of course, being at a younger age, I remember the most, the most traumatic moments with her versus the good moments with her because that's what happens in your childhood. You remember trauma over everything else. And if I was to say, well, like at a younger age, it was odd behaviors that I noticed. Like she would count food. She would count grapes. And then one minute we're Muslim, the next minute we're Rastafarians. And then it just started to flip-flop to where, you know, her thing with me was very controlling. She walked me, she came and picked me up from my grandmother's house every morning and, and we rode the bus to school every day. I don't think she ever left the school because lunchtime she was there in a the cafeteria eating with me and she was the only parent. And then as the school bell rang, she was the parent right outside the door. 
So she made me her entire world. So to go and to progress more into like when I got to like fifth and sixth grade, her absence became starting to become less. And she was not taking me to school anymore. And she was not around anymore. And then she started to develop this personality of just laughing to herself. And we still didn't think that there was a problem. We just thought that she was just having moments because nobody knew what mental illness was. We didn't at least know what mental illness was. And when I would ask my grandmother, what's going on with my mom, she's acting weird. She's like, oh, she's just going through some things. Well, that doesn't help me because I don't know what the things are. And as I went into middle school, it got worse. And, like, she would just totally, I would be there physically, but and she would never acknowledge that I'm right there with her and we're in the same apartment. And she's just on the couch having a full-blown conversation with herself, just talking to herself, laughing to herself, singing to herself, and she wouldn't get up and get me anything to eat. She, it's like I wasn't even there anymore. And then it just got to the point where it escalated even more to where, I was now a threat to her, and now she had to diminish the threat and get rid of the threat, and then my life was at stake. So it were different signs that was just missed and not looked at as having a problem, but just going through some things. Now, thank you so much for your candor. It must be, it's painful hearing it, so it must be painful to you even still to talk about these things. And I, again, I admire your courage. And, and uh, I, I think part of the problem in any small community is that we don't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. so, or we don't know what it is to explain exactly. what is going on. Exactly. And, and, you know, I think both of you have kind of quietly expressed something that I heard someone, and I don't remember who it was, say, "Oh, you know, we ha we can't make people think that mental, you know, mentally ill people are violent." Well, you know, not too long after that person said that to me, and again, I don't remember who it was, a mentally ill person killed someone on St. Croix mm -hmm. graveyard, and that was tragic. And you know, we're not here to talk about and complain about all the problems we have here. We're ta here to talk about. What can we do about this? How do we as a community, we had, Laverne and I had dinner with a lovely friend of mine who's visiting from National Geographic in Washington, uh, who's listening in this morning, um, last night about community. And that, and you know, and Laverne mentioned this morning, we cannot continue to live in little pockets of um, isolation. Because isolation, to me, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on, on mental illness, although I, you know, I have mental illness in my own family that's, that's caused by alcoholism and drug addiction. And, again, we don't talk about that. We either say they're bipolar or they're an alcoholic, and we mm -hmm. forget that they're related. So, um, you know, let's admit that we do have to be, we do have to treat each other with kid gloves in many ways, ways but especially people who are challenged and who don't see reality in the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. And you're, again, uh, Tasha, you're dealing with this. How, how do you go about that? What do you see? How can we, I mean, I believe one of the ways to stop having children growing up damaged is to, is to you know, as a community, stand up against child abuse. Um, most definitely. Um, I, I think that um, it takes a community to address these issues. I'm sorry. It takes a community to address these issues. And if we don't do it together, um, to piggyback earlier on what you said, how we try to, or as a culture, what happens at home stays at home, or what we're going through, a lot of, I guess, growing up, yes, and could probably relate to feeling isolated, like she was the only one going through this, when indeed there were probably other classmates or peers of hers that went through the same thing. So I think if we can if we can begin the conversation and allowing people to understand that they're not alone would be a start. And that was the worst feeling of all, not realizing that, you know, I didn't find out until after I wrote the book that three of my classmates actually have mothers that were also suffering from depression. But they came to school every day laughing and normal, like everything was just fine. And one of them was even the comedian of the class. 
And I had no idea whatsoever that they were suffering too. And I felt like if I just knew that there was somebody else like me that had a mother that was suffering and I had a support team, things may have been different in my mind. And I went, I did the opposite. I became an introvert. And I just stood out from, I just stood away from everyone else because I felt like I had this heavy burden on me, no one to speak to about how I was feeling. The kids were bullying me, and I had no protection. And I pretty much had to learn how to self-cope, which is so hard, because now that trickled into my adult life to where I'm the same person. I'm still the introverted type of person. I come out now because I'm speaking out and trying to get others' help. But I'm still where if I go into a room with a lot of people, I'll still find the, the, the go in, way in the back and find the darkest place to stand because I still haven't learned how to cope with people on a, on a public level. And I do public speaking and people are like, are you serious? It's like, yeah, but this trickled in from my childhood of having to put myself in invisibility mode in my own mind to cope. Well, but I think you're doing exactly what, um, is suggested often is that you do something to address the fear and the change that you want. So mm-hmm. you, it sounds to me like you're on the right road, and I absolutely commend you for that kind of action. I have a question for, for Tesha with respect to um, the, the conversation we've been having so far. To me, sounds like we're saying we have a community, like all communities all over the place, where there are people that are having problems um, and at different levels. Mm-hmm. What would you suggest um, that would help a community to figure out when it's time to go and talk to somebody? They shouldn't have to hurt somebody, mm-hmm. you know, or do something extremely drastic. What would you suggest, especially for a community that, that well, you know, we have denial is one of our big time characteristics. We like pretending things do not exist. Um, but what do we? What would you suggest that we could do that would would improve the situation with respect to mental illness in our community? Well, you have to look at patterns of behavior that are not normal, and if you're if you're observing these things, then and, and most often times it would have you would get a confirmation with someone else saying that they've observed something as well. So let's not ignore the confirmations. Let's mm-hmm. not ignore the 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 examples um, that people may bring up as being bizarre. And then seeking medical help, it, uh, your physician, your doctor, um, someone so that then, you know, the patterns can be observed and, and assessed properly. I wanted to mention something that I was, I had another friend over here who's very involved in early childhood development, and we taped a show that we'll be playing on August 15th, it's Ellie Hirsch, who many of you know. But she was talking about buffers and that children in early childhood, when they're in, you know, not particularly positive situations at home, can be very much helped by by having buffers. And yes, and that's what I hear you saying, that your life might have been very different growing up if there had been any buffers. Yes, and, and education, because the family was going through this with her, and we didn't know that she was suffering from mental illness or depression. We know now, we can put a name to it now, because it asked my grandmother the signs, and all the signs point to she had depression and anxiety, which went untreated for many, many years, and then developed into schizophrenia. I mean, even when she had her nervous breakdown, my grandmother was in shock to her what it, that it actually had a name for it all this time, and she didn't know. So a lot of it, I think, has to do with bringing the community aware of what the symptoms for each and every single one of the illnesses is. And once we know the symptoms, we can then look within ourselves and train the professionals, like the teachers, the counselors, the police officers, the fire, anyone in the community that has to do with children. Because I believe that children, that's a STEM. Anxiety, the medium age for anxiety starts at age 11. So that's a very early age to have an onset of mental illness that starts in a child. And if that keeps going on and progresses into childhood, by the time that child turns a teen and added with hormones, we have a double cognitive brain effect going on in this child's life. With what outlet? None. Because they don't know what they're, they don't know what's going on in their body. They don't know what's going on and we're not paying attention to the signs. No, I think you you gave some really good suggestions. It sounds to me like we're talking about making sure that we get more information out into the public about 
what the symptoms might be. Yeah. There are a lot of places that I've been where they have signs up in different places. And I mean, for instance, we have a lot of people that have, um, are part of many different kinds of churches or organizations right. and stuff. And those are places where mm -hmm. put those kinds of that type of information. And then so this is where you could go if you have a question. Right. And I have to tell you, the biggest thing you want to do is get people to the place where if they are worried themselves that they will go and ask for help. I, I'll tell you a secret. Um, this is clearly in the key. I have a birthday coming up, so I must be getting this older thing is a trip. Anyway, uh, when I was in school and I, I was having a tough time as an undergraduate and people were harassing me because I was too different, um, my coping mechanism was to walk by people and blow up their heads in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it sounds bad. funny it's now. <laughs> it, it sounds funny, but to me that's normal. But here's the thing. <laughs> I hate myself so badly. I went to, I, I, I have to go to the psychologist on campus. I have to go to, the person says, well, are you planning to do this? I said, no, no, no. He says, fine. He says, this is, you'll be okay. It's just a way of coping with a problem. <laughs> Next two days it was gone. But again, you have to, the, the part that I'm trying to get people to remember, hopefully, is that you have to go ask somebody something. Mm -hmm. Okay, go and ask. Uh, but we're too afraid to ask because then we're judged and then we're considered crazy. Like, I'm sure many of your listeners just heard you say that, and they probably thought in their mind, oh, my God, my bone is crazy. And then now in my mind and Tisha's mind, who deal with this on a daily basis, oh, that's normal. I, I agree, yes. <laughs> You know what? What Laverne just said is that we that someone talked to her about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not only this idea of finding the courage somehow as a kid or as an, a, a you know anybody. I mean, mm -hmm. of any age, reach out and say I need help. But also for parents and community members and neighbors and pastors and and you know people in this community to remain open. Mm -hmm to say to people, and it's what we did when we started the show this morning, was to say, if you have an idea, if you want to talk about something, call us. We'll be open to it. And to make that a possibility for anybody, mm -hmm. for all of us to start to do that. And I hear this stuff, you know, children are to be seen and not heard. That is, that is a That's recipe, how we were raised. A recipe for disaster. That's but, how we were raised. But it comes, it's a historical, um, you know, left over. It comes out of a time when it was not safe. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. To be to be out acting out, especially as a person of color in Absolutely. many, many places. It's still not safe. In Don't many me. places. In fact I just read an article yesterday um on how to get um seven seven ways that young boys get to safe ways to get you home. The business with the police and it's about not looking you're not, not looking hostile and keeping your hands out. Yeah. And it's, we're going back to the old days. That's how mm -hmm. that used to be, especially in, in, in the United States mainland. It wasn't quite so bad here. But, I mean, that's part of a leftover thing. But you're right. Um, now we have to figure out a way to deal with communication on a different kind of level. You know, and we, someone asked me a question the other day about what would have made it different? What would have made my mind different growing up? And you know the answer to that question? If somebody had just turned to me one time, and this has never happened, to this day it still doesn't happen. Yes, are you okay? How are you dealing with the situation with your mother? How does that make you feel? Yeah. That's the denial um, thing. People are pretending they're not seeing it. Exactly. Um, actually, when I think about what Yasin has been through, her immediate surroundings didn't know to say that because they didn't know themselves. Right. Well, what, what answer would they have given me? They, they couldn't give me any. They didn't even know the answers themselves. Well, here's the thing. I'm saying that everybody has, there's no society that does not have a sense of what is normal behavior. You mm -hmm. know what is, if somebody's out in the middle of the street singing <laughs> under what is going on. They could be very happy, but you know that is not necessarily normal behavior. So my, so I think when you ignore that, then you're, 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 you just can't handle the difference. Yeah, and that's the part that we need to get past because it could be a good thing. Um, recently, 
there was a situation where someone was moving um, from a from out of a presidency, and the behavior on the day that the person got out of the presidency, I mean, I said, "Are you okay?" I mean, I I, I didn't know something had happened, but I said, "I'm so happy to." It had been so stressful that the behavior was like 180 degrees to where mm -hmm. they normally were. Mm -hmm. But you need to ask. I agree with you, and I'm so sorry that someone did not. And um, hopefully that as you go through your life, if something else happens, that will not be the case. But before we go on, please allow me to say thank you to our sponsors, because we couldn't do this conversation, and it is a good one. I'm so happy you folks took the time to share um, your lives with us today. But we couldn't do it without the support from the Water and Power Authority, the West Indian Company Limited, Choice Communications, St. Thomas Source, or Sunrise Rotary. We really appreciate their putting forward their best efforts to make sure that the community is a little bit better. Yes, and I don't know if you're familiar with um, the nonviolent communications that was set forth by Marshall Rosenberg, but it's something that I really believe in. and have studied and spent some time in intensive workshops on, and it's based on feelings and needs and and empathy. And, you know, and what you say, and I, you know, I grew up with two alcoholic parents and, and then an alcoholic mother and an alcoholic stepfather. And a teacher said to me one day, and I, this is, in, I was 16 years old at the time, I have never forgotten this. She said, Sean, it's not you, mm -hmm. it's your parents. Mm -hmm. And it, it changed my world. Mm -hmm. It changed my world. I mean, I still had my old, my, you know, I still had to deal with things, but I've never forgotten that and was the only person in my life who was, you know, kind of apart from the situation, who wasn't invested in the situation in one mm -hmm. way or the other, who, ob in, who observed a behavior and validated that I was okay, that it mm -hmm. wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I... Tasha, I assume this is what the people who are working with these young, these, you know, young people at Seaview uh, Adolescent Center do. Yes, exactly. We have to remind them that it's not their fault, mm -hmm. and they had nothing to do with it, and that they are still whole, and they are still worthy, and they still can make a difference and be who they want to be in spite of. Their, their beginnings or because of their parents, and they still can love them, they can still be productive, and they can still, you know, do as they wish. Um, I, I think for me, that's what stands out for me is what Yasin says, where um, just asking them how are they doing and, 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 you know, just checking in. Checking in with them, I think, makes a, a, a tremendous difference in letting them know that they, they are being thought of and, and that they are special. And what if, you know, this is, and checking in is one of the modalities that's part of nonviolent communication. So when you're in a workshop, you go around a circle mm -hmm. and you start by saying checking in, and there's a list of feelings and needs. What are you feeling? What are you needing? And mm -hmm. what if we start, what if we did that just in school? What if, mm -hmm. at, at right, exactly. Class, I'm loving this conversation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Says, each one of these kids every morning, let's check in. And, and I'm willing to make copies, folks, that are out there of these this feelings and needs list that is universal. These are universal feelings and needs. I'm feeling scared. I need safety. I'm feeling irritated. I need freedom. I need communion. I need connection. I, you know, and I've practiced this with my nine-year-old grandson, and I'm telling you that it works. Mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, the first thing I taught him was autonomy, and then he had choices. And the second thing that happened was when I would say to him, well, do you want to do this? He would say, I'll think about it. But, you know, as much as that was frustrating, I was so delighted that he began to understand that he had a choice. And we don't, we don't let our kids know they have a choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this whole checking in idea, anybody who's listening out there who's dealing with young people, just try it. Yeah. Have a chance to listen. Yep. Every so I often, a, a teen, I have two teenagers at home now, and boy, what a difference. And, you know, teenagers, when, when they become teenagers, they tend to go inward in themselves, and they're more around their friends. They don't want to be around you. You know, you're old. You know, you're outdated. Mom's not cool anymore. So we lose that communication gap with our teenagers. So I think it's our job as parents to ever so often just ask your child, 
How are you doing today? Are anybody bullying you in school? How's your school? School is great because my kids are A school, A students, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a, they couldn't have a problem. They could very well have a problem and still be A school, A students because I was. So whatever happened to me back then, I didn't want it to trickle on to my children. And one day, out of the blue, my daughter is the type of daughter that's every morning, good morning, mom. In the afternoon, hey, mom, school's great. In the night, good night, mom, love you. And she still maintained that, but randomly at dinner, I asked her, how are you doing? And she said, I'm kind of sad because I couldn't get this one dance at dance, and I kept trying. And mine, the dance class was like three days ago. So, and she, and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, she never showed anything. Like, this was bothering her. So I started to ask her more, well, maybe you should try, do you want to see somebody? For this? She's like, no, I just need to just practice on it more. And it was just bothering me. I just wanted to tell you, bye, Mom. And, but she told me. No, that's, that is a really good story to share because I think a lot of people don't realize how important it is to ask and to look for the signs. I'm always um, a little saddened when people say they don't understand why this person killed themselves because there were no signs. When yes, they were. Bet you any kind of money that mm -hmm. that is not the case. It's they were. We didn't. We missed it. Mm -hmm. We missed it. Um, and so we need to. We really do need to pay a little bit more attention. I think our conversation today is about us taking care of us better. We are the ones that have to take care of each other. And that means that the person that you live with, the people you work with every day, you have an opportunity to reach out and, again, and don't take on bigger than you can handle, but just asking the question, is it okay, are you all right? Sure. Something seems to be not well. Maybe you can go and talk to this person or do that. That's all that's necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And knowing the resources for when, and especially teachers, I think they need to be trained into how to approach a child with a situation. Like if somebody, even if a teacher asks them, okay, is everything okay, are they equipped enough to handle the question, the answer that they're going to get? Well, Do they know the right resources to take them, to, to offer them for whatever they're about to hear? And are we willing to intervene mm -hmm. as, a, as a community mm -hmm. in situations I mean, I had a situation several years ago, and I probably shouldn't talk about it, and I won't go into detail, but where I knew about something was going on, and it, it was the person who was perpetrating the violence was uh, an untouchable, uh, you know, was uh, somebody in this community that you know, gave a lot of money and da da da, and I went behind the scenes and saw to it that there, a stop was put to that. and. You know, we're afraid to do that because there are, listen, there are repercussions. But do you want to live with yourself when a child ends up, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a situation having to be taken out of the home and, and cannot function in society because of what is, is happening? And we know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Somebody knows about what's happening in these abusive situations. And, you know, I don't believe, certainly there are spontaneous things that happen in terms of mental illness or, but a lot of it is lifestyle stuff. A lot of it is things that we can do something about to prevent what's going to happen, like with your mom, yes, and much mm -hmm. later. There had been an intervention somewhere along the line. Well, one of the things we do need to pay attention to in the community is, again, you have to stay away from denial. Mm -hmm. uh, some forms of mental illness can be inherited and you can pass on things through living in particular kinds of environments. So if you know, if you are someone that has that kind of experience, you might want to go and talk to somebody about your own probability or issues that might show up. I mean, that's what the preventative stuff is about, okay? Mm -hmm. It's about taking care of yourself by learning as much as possible. One of the things about being a human being is that along with our thinking brains and feelings, come on this this possibility of things not working right and you have to figure out how to deal with the dysfunctionality of it. We don't want to have people in our community acting out where they hurt other people mm -hmm. themselves because they aren't able to deal with what's happening in their heads. Well the um, first the, sorry I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no I was going to say the first thing we need to get over the community is the fear of being crazy. That is very, that's a very big stigma down there. Everybody is afraid of being crazy because being crazy is the worst form of a human being to be down there. And we need to get out of that realm of thinking that because you're not crazy. There is hope for recovery. You can live a normal, natural life if caught on time with recovery. There is hope. There's no end to it. 
And we need to teach the community that, that because you may have a problem, don't be afraid that somebody's going to think that you're crazy. We need to get that word crazy out of people's vocabulary into the understanding that I have an illness that is I can handle with recovery is what yeah, we need to show, say. You are definitely showing your age because we have <laughs> our generation yes. talking about people being crazy. That when Because crazy covers a lot of different kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. In everything from being slightly different, mm -hmm. acting out all the way through to mental illness. And we cover, we use one word to cover the entire gamut. Mm -hmm. That is very, very un, unsafe. Because it allows you to to not address some things. As you said, you just gave some excellent um, advice for people to think about in terms of taking care of things. Before we move on, I have a question for both of you. I want to know what you would suggest to our community to do differently to deal with mental health. I mean, there's always stuff on the, the, the television and in the papers and, you know, radio shows about we need to have more mental health facilities and more doctors, more places, but what would the two of you suggest, having the kinds of experiences you've had, that you think would um, help the community to address mental illness in a, in a more effective way? Tisha, you go um, first. Uh, well, uh, yes, and when did you start? Oh, me? I was going to give Tisha the mic first. <laughs> <laughs> since, since she's right there on the island, I was going to give her and then feed off of what she said. Um. What can we do first? Um, basically, the first thing that comes to my mind is living in balance. Um, we tend to work hard. Um, however, there's no after. We need to develop um, ways in which we cope with long, hard days at work. Uh, we need, and then the whole checking in. Um, on Fridays, it's, it's common at my house where on Fridays we we just let loose, we hang out, we, we touch bases, we do things so that we can then, you know, unwind from the week because it's been a long week. I think um, there isn't a habit of being okay with just relaxing. Um, culturally, again, um, with men, they work very, very hard, and then they tend to do what on the weekend? It's, it's, um, some of them may tend to do um, things that are not that healthy. As, as a way of coping or relaxing. So developing, you know, healthier ways of, of relaxing and coping and, and doing things that are stress-free, that are healthy. I think that's one, um, some of the things that we would like, I would like to see happening. Um, even just as a community, having other things, um, leisurely activities for the community to engage in that doesn't involve just carnival or just um, the, the big holidays, but on an ongoing basis, having outlets where families can engage with each other. I, I just want to mention something that's part of the Rotary Practice Peace Initiative that we are hoping to do in, I think, November, is to have a services fair. Right. And that could be included in it. It's because there are things. There's Zumba going on. There's a lot of things going on at Yacht Haven Grand. There's yoga classes. There's. I was just down there yesterday. And I was looking. It was their June schedule, but there are um, there are Tai Chi classes that I think uh, I'm trying to think. Um, oh God, I'm trying to remember his name. Was teaching them on Monday and Wednesday nights at six o'clock. These are all very healthy mm -hmm. ways. So part of the services fair can also. I mean, we want to let people know, and it's going to be probably at Tutu Park Mall. They, they don't know it yet. <laughs> It's something we've been more talking about since the peace initiative. Well, I think before, yes, and before you give yours, uh, I want to thank Tesha for, for giving that particular um, way of moving our community forward. The, the challenge, I guess, I see us trying to deal with with respect to what you're suggesting is that, for instance, did you talk about Zumba and yoga and Tai Chi and stuff like that? A lot of people, they, they, that they don't know how to relate to that because they haven't exposed enough, themselves to it enough. So my suggestion is to think about things that you like to do. If you like to go to uh, Megan's Bay or just walk down to the park or um, go sit on your porch with 10 of your friends and your family, whatever, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do 
what the other people are doing. It's about what makes you relax in a healthy way. Um, and, and I think that's the part that we're missing. Some people, I mean, th there are people that, that enjoy going to choir practice. Because I can't sing at all. I can't help with that. But the, I, I, I envy them. I think that's a wonderful thing. That, so stuff like that we need to think about. All right. Yes, and I know you've thought of some things. <laughs> been trying to fix the world for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Not fix, but recover. <laughs> recover the world. Get us healing. Um, St. Thomas is a very small place, and it's only but so much things that you can do on one island in your entire life over and over and over and over again. And we need to learn to develop coping skills. And I think that is that is critical. And that's why I'm developing a team up up here from up here of mental health coaching, life coaching, to come down to the Virgin Islands in October. And that's all we're going to do the whole month. We're going to do one on one individual coping skills. We're going to do family community coping skills. To me the key for Saint Thomas is teaching people how to cope. Y'all have a lot going on in that one little space of island for a lot of people to deal with. And sometimes going to the beach is not enough. Going, to, like some, sometimes you just have to say, well, how do I cope? How do I, like going to, I can sit on the beach all day long, and that may meditate my mind, but what in my mind do I need to think about so, can, so I can help me cope? Like for instance, I have trouble relaxing, and I have to tell myself, you know, turn off all electronics. And there's a step-by-step -step process in your mind that I have to coach myself down to just to get to that point of relaxation. But I have to learn those steps in order for it to help me relax. Because I'm a going person. I run seven businesses, and I'm here, there, everywhere, kids, blah, 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 blah. And how do I cope? I have to learn. I have to learn that. So I think with the team that I'm bringing down, I think that we can help teach the community steps on how to cope with the things that are going on with life so that we can go on with life and have a healthy life. You know, I love the fact that what we're talking about here is people helping people. Right. We're not talking about, you know, you know, world-renowned psychiatrists or, no. you know, the medical community. And nobody has even mentioned pharmaceuticals. No. And which to me is a last resort. Right. And I'm also in recovery, yes, and in a different way, and have been for 32 years. And the coping techniques are, I am so excited to, and we will get, the, we're gonna get the word out for you in every way possible. So please, you know how to reach me and keep us up to date on this. Will do. Yes, and, and, and Sean, I ask both of you, again, to think about your audience. We're having this challenge right now with another project that I'm involved in. The people that we want to come out, we have to learn how to speak to them in a way that they feel comfortable to do this. And so you want to think about um, how you would let people know that this is an opportunity that they can use. Now, remember you're talking to folks who may think that it's not a good thing to be a little different and mm -hmm. or crazy. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to be seen as not being able to do. We have a lot of folks that won't go get help because... Mm -hmm. I want people to know that they might not be perfect. Right. And I think that's where the private comes in, when the private one-on-one -on -one comes in. Because I found that when I was on the island in January, along with all the other things that I had to do, people were texting me, yes, I think, I, and I don't know them. They just saw my number on Facebook or heard my number on the air. And they would text me and call me, I just need somebody to talk to. Can you come by or meet me at the beach or meet me by this restaurant? or meet? Now, I don't know these people from nowhere. But I took the time to go meet with them privately and speak to them and I just listen to what they were saying. Sometimes people just need somebody to just listen, that they can trust, that they know that the information won't end up on the street. But then now I had, when I, when I did that, I found the problem of, okay, a lot of the situations are deeper than I can handle, and I didn't know what resources to tell them. So now I'm bringing those resources with me. Well, I think you just two things you just mentioned that are really important. Number one, the um, business of us getting more information out about the resources available. Maybe we don't have as much as we would like, but we have more than we think we do. Mm -hmm. And we need we to make sure that we figure out how to get people like yourself to be able to tell other people where they can go. Exactly. This is one of the things that um, Sean and I and other folks involved in this project started trying to put together. That's why we hope this services fair will help people to understand what the opportunity. I mean, there are a lot of programs around here, but you have to know 
where to go and what, what will work. Yeah. The second is confidentiality. This is a problem for the territory in the health area in general. Um, the University of Virgin Islands has done some work at CERC about one of the some of the, the challenges that we face in our health system, and confidentiality came up as one of the big, big issues in terms of people not wanting to go to doctors or to the hospital because they feel that the information is not private. Okay, it becomes even more so if they go to a space where you're asking them to come to a space where somebody else might know that there's some stigma, as far as they're concerned, attached with the activity that you're going to do. Also, they would have to trust the people they go to. So we're going to have to work on that in terms of, remember what I was just saying about how you get the information out? Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out how you would tell people that this is something that they can put trust in. This is one of our big, big issues at the, our conference a year, almost two years ago. Apparently, Virgin Islanders have problems with trust from their personal relationships all the way up to government house. Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, uh, probably no really. Yeah. <laughs> um, we feel we have no authority. We, ha we have no confidence at all. No, and I think that one of the things that we started out talking about when we started the show, and also it came up in the in the um, in the, the peace conference, is gossip. The next time you start to open your mouth about something that you absolutely don't even know is true, or even if you do, try just not doing it. Uh, and I, I'm saying that to myself too. I, I fall into that category of gossip, and that's you know that's how a lot of it starts. But we got started late this morning, unfortunately, and we're going to have to close down in a couple of minutes. So I want to take a moment to let Tasha talk about anything else she wants to say about the work that she's doing here in the community. Well, okay, um, just for um, so everyone can kind of understand where we're, we're located at St. Thomas. Um, we're St. Thomas Healthcare Management Inc located at Seaview, um, we're next to Seaview Nursing Home. We are a residential facility, and um, the number that you can call if you have any questions is 777-2864, and it's an adolescent program. 777-2864. Thank you for this opportunity tell, to Tell share. us a little bit about what you the criteria for the young people who come here. You have day students. You have day students as well as residential students. We have a residential program, and we also have a day treatment program. Day treatment meaning that they come there for school during the day, but then they return home um, at the end of the day. And then we also have the residential where there are also um, some some residents stay there and go to school, and then also some that stay there go to their neighborhood school. So there are different programs in which um, the adolescents can partake in. It's an incredible program. Thank God for the people who are doing this. Yes, and we're getting ready to close. So if you have anything else to say, now is your time. Now is your moment. I want to first thank Tisha. I visited the behavioral center when I was there in January, and I must say that they're doing an excellent job with the children there. And the children are making a change. They're making an impact. And I commend the staff and everyone there at the Behavioral Center. Y'all get major kudos from me. And I support you all 100%. Um, I wanted to let the, the public know on behalf of what I'm trying to do also takes funding. And it's just their hotel accommodation. I'm volunteering my time. I'm volunteering my house in St. John so, so these people can come and stay, but they still need to eat. If restaurants down there are willing to donate food, so this, this team that are coming to help the community on their own time to, um, to feed them, and rental car companies, if they were willing to donate the rental cars so that we can transport an air, air, air shuttle from St. Thomas to St. Croix, we need about six people that are going to be traveling back and forth to all three of these islands, and we need the support from the islands to welcome these people that are volunteering their time to help our community. Well, I can promise you that the source stands behind what you're doing, and we'll get the word out. So you and I will talk in the next week or so, and we'll get some word out and ask for that help. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank uh, you for having me. Once, once again, I'm so touched by the, you know, what we are able to do here every day, and I know that those people listening appreciate it. And I want to mention, as we're closing this morning, that we there is no way that we could do this without the incredible. We have an incredible community here. 
and we have people who step up to the plate time and time and time again uh, to, to give of their resources so that we can have these conversations and to do a lot of other things in this community. So thank you to, to Sunrise Rotary, St. Thomas Source, Choice Communications, the West Indian Company Limited, and the Water and Power Authority. And you know, thank you to my friend Laverne Ragster and some of the other people who show up here. And thank you to WSTA for giving us this time and support commercial-free every Saturday. Uh, we'll keep doing this. We want to remind you folks that peace is up to us and that we hope that you have a wonderful week. Go with peace.